Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so thank you to Promin for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the tools that we use at BMS to try to um, help select our lead uh, molecules as well as um, what to do if we do see a high level of risk um, as far as potential deimmunization strategies. Um, so for today, I'm going to start with a brief introduction of clinical immunogenicity. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about our toolbox, focusing mostly on the in silico and in vitro tools that we use. Um, and then I'll end today with uh, two different case studies on how we use these tools um, for lead optimization. So a little bit of background. Um, Valerie already talked a little bit about this, but um, we, t we consider immunogenicity to be the presence of uh, host antidrug antibodies against the biologic and circulation. Um, even though most antibodies nowadays are humanized or fully human, they still um, have the potential to elicit an immune response, and we, in fact, we see that most of them still do. Um, and as far as in the clinic, we see a whole range of responses. We can have clinically irrelevant um, host antidrug antibodies as, as, and as problematic as life-threatening syndromes um, when we see cross-reactivity to endogenous counterparts, such as with EPO and insulin. Um, but in general, serious adverse events are relatively rare. Um, as far as efficacy, antidrug antibodies can affect both um, the, the efficacy by uh, neutralizing the drug if they bind to the CDR and block target, um, and they can also change PK exposure either in a negative or a positive way. So uh, it, recently, um, immunogenicity has really been um, in the news a lot. This is a couple of stories that were taken in the last few years um, that have even made Wall Street Journal showing um, some late development um, programs that were actually stopped because of, in part, due to anti-drug antibodies. So on the top is a PCSK9 drug that was, uh, the development was stopped by Pfizer, and on the bottom is a factor seven um, antibody by Novo Nordisk. So as a lead selection, lead optimization group, we're really trying to see what we can do to kind of predict this and, 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 and um, eliminate this from our drug development programs. So w when you kind of consider prediction or, or what may happen in humans, the most obvious thing to do is to look at animal um, models of, of what may happen. And it's really known that um, there's a very low correlation to animal studies with clinical studies as far as the generation of anti-drug antibodies. We know that rodents are very overpredictive of immunogenicity rates. And th although there's been some arguments about the use of non-human primates, there was a very good study um, back in 2013 um, by Van Meer who looked at a number of different clinical antibodies that have been in the clinic in Europe and have been approved. And he saw a very poor correlation between the incidence of ADAs in non-human primates and humans. In fact, it was only 59%, so barely um, above 50%. And one of the main reasons he found was that in non-human primates, the ADA is generally against the human FC region, which would be foreign to them, um, whereas clinical ADA are primarily against the foreign sequences in the CDRs. So in our view, we really think animal models are not predictive of human immunogenicity. And if you want to try to get to um, attempting to predict if human immunogenicity, you really need to use human cells and human models. The problem is that Immunogenicity is a very complicated um, story, and it has a lot of different risk factors that you know, we can see um, that are related to the patient and some that are related to the protein. And unfortunately, not all of these can really be looked at um, if you want to use an in vitro system. So as far as for the patient, um, one of the major ones is the HLA. These are the proteins that present um, the different peptides to your immune system. Um, there's also the status of the immune system. There's previous exposures, pre-existing antibodies, et cetera. Um, as far as the protein goes, the major one, obviously, are the presence of T-cell epitopes or foreign sequences that the immune system will recognize as foreign and mounted immune response against. There's also modifications, aggregations, and contaminants, um, like the host cell proteins Valerie just described, as well as um, target biology, route of administration, and frequency of dosing. And all these factors can sort of uh, play a role in, in whether immunogenicity is developed or not. So um, the factors in red are kind of the ones that I think you can mostly look at in in vitro systems. So we think we can try to predict a little bit, but you're never going to be able to predict the totality of this story because of so many different factors involved. 
So when I first started trying to develop um, in vitro systems that would test this, we started by looking at the, the process of how an anti-drug antibody to a biologic is formed in the first place. And that is shown um, on this slide. Starting on the left, you have your biologic. It'll be taken up um, and processed by antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, through phagocytosis or endocytosis. It'll um, present small peptides in complex with MHC on its surface. Um, in the next step, a CD4 T cell can recognize that peptide MHC complex. It'll become activated and start proliferating. And then the activated CD4 T cell can interact with a B cell that recognizes that same um, biologic, causing differentiation of these B cells to plasma cells and the generation of antidrug antibodies. Now at Bristol-Myers Squibb, we have a number of different models that we've used to kind of analyze these different phases of this pathway. Um, today, I'll be talking um, mostly about the in silico and uh, the two in vitro PBMC-based assays. So IDAB is our version of an in silico um, prediction algorithm. We'll talk about that in um, a couple slides. This basically is a model that scans your peptide and looks for sequences that are predicted to have high affinity to the various HLAs um, in, in the human population. Um, we also have, um, as well as ProMune, a, a MAPS-based assay where you isolate peptide MHC complexes directly from pulsed dendritic cells. You can elute out the peptides and then run an LCMS-based uh, technology to identify the actual peptides that are presented. And these two assays kind of get at this first step of antigen processing and presentation. If you go a little further and include the T cells um, themselves, we have um, a PBMC-based proliferation assay, um, as well as a B cell or a dendritic cell-based assays, which I'll describe in a little bit. And we're also uh, started development on a cytokine profile assay. And this is really helpful to try to distinguish whether a response is innate or adaptive. And it's also very useful to figure out if you have an unusual response in one of these proliferation assays, whether there's a contaminant or something else might be going on um, by different uh, patterns of cytokines that are exposed. And then the, the last model, which I won't describe today, is a humanized mouse model. Um, this is really the only model that we have in-house that is able to generate anti-drug antibodies to a therapeutic protein. All of these others, um, you know, just uh, a, couple, a couple stages of this pathway. Um, so this model appears to maybe be the best chance of being predictive, but it's extremely expensive working on humanized mouse uh, mo models. And it's, it's hard to deal with multiple donors, multiple proteins in that system. So to briefly describe our in silico tools, this is um, kind of the gist of, of these algorithms in general. They are MHC peptide T cell interaction um, shown on the, on the left half. And what these do, as I mentioned, is they'll scan a, a protein of interest. Um, and, and they basically go through the sequence and look for a peptide that is predicted to bind with high affinity to the MHC um, class II alleles. And it's able to do this because we know that the um, MHC groove fits on approximately nine amino acids, and the positions at one, four, six, and nine are the anchor points. And using a, a database of hundreds of thousands of different um, aff affinities, they can then use that data to predict whether uh, your sequence of interest will have high affinity. And in general, these um, give scores such as showing on the right where there's a cumulative score based on your protein and you can kind of rank order your different proteins of interest. So the, the tool that we use in, at Bristol-Myers Squibb, we call um, IDAB. It's based on um, the immune epitope database from La Jolla, which is a, a free software. Um, it is based on 27 major HLA uh, archetypes from DRB1, covering about 95% of the human variability. They also have DP, DQ available. And in general, the way we use it is, is the consensus of three different binding models that cover the eight major alleles. Um, so as I showed you in the previous slide, normally a protein just gets a single score. And we wanted a little bit more linearity with our program. So We've converted this a little bit um, to, to what you see on the right. And I, I apologize, I had to uh, get this through the lawyer so everything is X'd out for sequence. Um, but what we do is we, we highlight the CDR1, 2, and 3 regions. And then we give a score of 0 to, to 10 at each amino acid position. And how we do that, uh, just to, for instance, if you take spot 40, this 3, 
That means a 15 mer with this um, amino acid as its center binds to 30 percent um, with high affinity of the HLA alleles in our, our database. So um, this is a quick way to scan your sequence and see where there's potential T cell epitopes, where they're located, and compare different versions of antibodies um, against each other. So here, for instance, you can see that there's uh, some noise in the CDR1 region. There's a, a pretty strong T cell epitope in the CDR2 and in the, the region right before CDR3 where we would be concerned. And you can compare two different antibodies very quickly this way. So that is um, our in silico tool. Next, I'm going to be talking about our different in vitro tools. Um, as I mentioned, the in silico tools are kind of only really look at this first stage of, of this pathway. And it's known that they tend to overpredict um, issues with immunogenicity, potential immunogenicity. And th that is the, because they, they basically analyze every p possible peptide that can be created from your sequence. And we know that in, in MAPS assays, et cetera, not every peptide is presented um, by each individual. Moreover, there's also um, T cells that might not exist that recognize that peptide. Um, so they, in general, tend to overpredict. So we we've have a lot more faith in some of the in vitro assays because they incorporate both uh, the first two steps. And as I mentioned, the only one we have right now is the humanized mice that incorporates this third step. And the reason for that is that B cells are very hard to keep alive in culture. And um, it, it's very difficult to actually generate and keep them alive long enough to generate anti-drug antibodies. Um, so in, in general, we believe in vitro assays are much more predictive than in silico, but we use them in combination to try to get a, a, a good risk assessment for each protein that we look at. So this slide shows you um, the assay that we used for our, the bulk of our work, which is a PBMC proliferation assay. Um, in general, we f um, isolate peripheral blood mononuclear cells from various healthy donors and bank it down. When we're ready to run a cohort um, to analyze various proteins, we'll grab 40 of those donors, um, and they are MHC matched to class two for the world population, so we get a nice broad range of donors. We um, label those PBMCs with CFSC, which is a fluorescent dye that allows us to track for proliferation. We incubate them with proteins of interest and controls for seven days. Um, we'll label them with an anti-human CD4 APC and then run flow cytometry to get an idea of what the percentage of resting cells are shown here by high CFSC staining and CD4 staining versus the ones that have proliferated, which have lost a little CFSC staining. And then the ratio of this is what we use to declare um, whether a particular protein is positive in each individual donor based on our cutoff of media plus two standard deviations. So this assay served us well for, for years back in the days when we were at Nexus, and we dealt with scaffold proteins. Um, but of late, we're screening pretty much the bulk of Bristol-Myers Squibb's um, targets of interest. And as you may know, a lot of them are dealing with immuno-oncology. So a lot of these targets are interfere with T cell proliferation. And so we were concerned that the PBMC assay might not be appropriate to be screening these, and, and I'm showing you the reasons for that here. Um, and this has actually become a, a kind of early step that we do to test whether an, a protein is going to interfere in these assays. And this is what we call um, the KLH study, and it's simply asking whether an antibody can modulate the proliferation to KLH, which is a very strong inducer of CD4 proliferation in our hands. So on, uh, what I'm showing you here on the bottom, this is the waxes is just the sum of the signal to noise for 24 total donors that we've used in this study. Um, you can see that KLH alone has a very nice strong response here. When you add KLH to either Avastin or Herceptin, these are two antibodies that don't interfere with the T cell um, pathway activation and proliferation, you see very little modulation of that KLH induced proliferation. This is in stark contrast to what we see when we added MAB1, which is um, an inhibitor of a T cell regulatory protein. You can see that the entire signal is lost completely. So clearly, MAB1 should not be um, risk assessed in this PBMC-based assay. So to get around that, we, a couple of years ago maybe, uh, started development on a dendritic cell-based assay. And the key here is that you're separating exposure of your biologic to the bulk PBMCs, like the PBMC assay. Here you just expose your therapeutic protein to um, your antigen-presenting cell only, in this case, the dendritic cell. 
So what we do starting on the um, upper left is we isolate monocytes from PBMCs from our healthy donors using uh, magnetic bead isolation. We uh, differentiate those guys with a cytokine cocktail to uh, create immature dendritic cells. Those guys are then pulsed with our therapeutic protein. The therapeutic protein is washed away and then those cells are matured, um, creating pulsed mature dendritic cells. And those are the guys that we then add back to the uh, bulk PBMCs from those same donors, label it with human CD4 APC again, a seven day assay, and then look for um, proliferation of your CD4 T cells. And so just to show you some uh, results on a couple of different antibodies, I'm showing you on the left a PBMC KLH study where again we see um, very good responses to KLH alone, no modulation when KLH was added to Avastin. And then in this case we added MABX, you see a pretty significant drop in responses suggesting that it's inhibiting our PBMC based assay. The same protein was then put in a DC KLH study, again KLH strong responses, Avastin with KLH strong. And here we've restored um, KLH induced proliferation using MABX. So clearly, MABX can be run um, in a dendritic cell based assay, but should not be run in a PBMC based assay. So, in, in general, um, our workflow in our immunogenicity risk assessment group is shown here. Um, for all non immunological targets, we go straight to the PBMC based assay. If it's a potential immunological target or there's some other factor that we believe might interfere with that assay, we'll do KLH studies for the PBMC or the DC assay or even a B cell based assay where we pulse B cells. Um, there are cases where we see interference in all three of these assays and then we're kind of stuck at this point um, either running the MAP assay, identifying which peptides are presented by the dendritic cells, running those peptides in the PBMC based assay or simply creating overlapping peptides of the CDR regions or any other regions that are um, foreign and run those in the PBMC based assay. So just to show you a, a, a couple of data slides on um, how we're doing as far as the assay results go, um, this was an older study that we did initially when we first created the PBMC based assay. We wanted to get an idea of how good a repeatability we got so we did a kind of a qualification type exercise. Um, so this shows you three different cohorts of 40 different donors in each cohort shown in the various colors, blue, red, and green. Um, and we ran six different quality control proteins. These were all scaffold proteins or adnectins based from our previous uh, life at Anexus, as well as KLH and CON-A, which are two positive uh, strong inducers of CD4 proliferation. Um, and just quickly, you can scan, you see that we have a pretty broad range of responses and it's fairly good repeatability between the three different cohorts with um, standard deviations running anywhere between four and eight percent in general. So we, we, we do see quite good uh, repeatability in these cohorts with different proteins. We've also um, tried to see how well we correlate to immunogenicity in the clinic. So this is a recent slide I put together um, showing you 16 different assets of BMS that have actually been put into the clinic. So we have um, on the bottom x-axis here the percentage of positive donors um, that show ADA in the clinic. And on the y-axis is the combined data from the PBMC and the DC assays that I just described um, with the percent positive donors in those assays. And you can see for, for the most part we do see a pretty nice correlation. Um, there are a couple outliers we missed. Um, but in general what we do is, is square off anything greater than 40 percent is kind of what we consider high risk. Things between 20 and 40 percent are more of a medium risk and under 20 percent we consider to have low risk. Um, and in general, this is obviously a, a work in progress, but we are doing a, a decent job of, of identifying which ones may have risk. So in the last few minutes, I just wanted to describe um, a couple case studies and how we use these tools in, in real life to help select uh, lead optimization and, and select our lead molecules. So this first case study I'm going to talk to you about, um, it's just labeled MAB1 and MAB2. It's uh, humanized antibodies with a non-immunological target, so it showed no interference in, in the PBMC KLH study. Um, when it got to our hands, MAB1 was the lead of the program. Um, it had a backup, MAB2, which was about a month behind in development. So they were pushing strongly for MAB1. Obviously, there's uh, tight deadlines and they wanted to proceed as fast as possible. When we first looked at these um, using our in silico tools, the results are shown here. So I'm showing you just the V-heavy and um, 
in MAB1 on the top, MAB2 on the bottom for comparison. Um, there were six amino acid differences between the two shown in red, mostly in the CDR3 and the CDR1 regions. Um, and you can quickly scan the protein and see that there's a, kind of a, a low scoring T cell epitope in CDR1. There's some noise over here in the framework 2 CDR2 region and then a fairly hot region over here in the CDR3 region. And because of these uh, amino acid differences, you can see that there's a little bit of uh, higher numbers associated with MAB1, particularly here and in this stretch, than MAB2. So it looks, at least in silico-wise, that <coughs> MAB1 may have higher risk than MAB2. We, we stuck these into our in vitro-based assays. Um, and so just to show you, um, on the y-axis is the percentage of positive donors that have scored positive. Um, each positive donor is represented by a color um, in the box. On the far left, we have Avastin, which is our, our low quality control, as well as an IL-21R antibody um, that was our in-house version of a Pfizer antibody that was uh, stopped in late stage development for immunogenicity. And these are our low and high quality controls that you'll see throughout these slides. Um, next, we have the MAB1 that was made either in the CHO system or with hex cells. Um, you can see that they're pretty uh, consistent and running around 32.5%. The MAB2 and the HEC and CHO were running at around 15 or 17% in our hands. So this matches the in silico data, suggesting that MAB2 might have less risk both with in silico and in vitro tools. Um, and, and the fact that at this point when we presented this, all other features of these two drugs, affinity, um, scalability, concentration, were fairly equal. So we are able to switch um, the lead to MAB2 at this point based on this data. So we were able to um, use these tools to help change um, a potential lead coming into our hands. Um, in case study two, I just wanted to quickly describe something, um, what we, we do when we see high risk in all of our tools, um, what we can do. So here I'm going to be describing MAB A and B, and again, they're humanized antibodies. It's a non-immunological target. It was, um, didn't have a problem in our KLH study with the PBMC assay. Um, here I'm again showing you the in silico results. Um, in this case, there were seven amino acid differences shown, um, mo mostly in this area here and uh, these three right here. Um, what you can see is, is a fairly predicted hot T cell epitope in the CDR2 region. There's a very strong one in MAB B in the framework 3 region, and then kind of a, a lower one in the CDR3 region. Um, but clearly you can see that the big difference between these two is in this hot spot right here, um, and that MAB B would clearly be predicted to be higher uh, immunogenicity risk compared to MAB A by in silico. When we put these in our in vitro assays, um, again, the low and high quality controls are shown here. MAB A ran um, fairly high at 35 percent, um, and MAB B ran really high at about 52 percent. So again, this matched our in silico um, prediction. That isn't always the case, um, but in these two cases it did. Um, however, in both cases we felt uh, a little uneasy that there's uh, such a high risk associated with them both in silico and in vitro. So in this case, we used these tools to try to de-immunize um, these proteins and see if we could find one with a little bit more acceptable profile by these in vitro assays. So we took um, MAB A and we made three different changes which are shown here. There was two uh, amino acid sequence uh, conversions back to wild type in framework one which pretty much eliminated this hot spot um, predicted by in silico. And we made a second one shown here which eliminated this um, hot spot. And we made different variations of each which I'll describe um, the results in a little bit. The second one that we did is for MAB uh, B, and here we tr made a single amino acid change here which eliminated this very hot uh, T cell epitope that was not in MAB A. So we simply converted this sequence to this sequence. Um, so this allowed us to play a little bit and see which of these predicted hot spots have um, results and in, in changes in, in the PBMC in vitro assays. And that's shown here. So. Um, again, the low control and high control are on the far left. MAB A is uh, again showing about 35% responses in our assays. And what's interesting is that we made um, four different mutations, one that had one and three, two and three, three alone, or one, two and three. All four of them were successful to some extent in reducing the risk and 
the percentage of positive donors in this assay, but it really looks like the only one that matters is mutation three. When you added one or two or all three, it didn't really change much. And I'm just going to go back. Um, so one and two are shown here, and three was here. And three was the one that was, seemed to be important in the vitro assays, which is kind of a low-scoring T-cell epitope, according to in silico. This um, very strong T-cell epitope didn't seem to do much. So this might be an example of a false positive that's predicted by in silico. Going back to that slide, on the, on the right half of that slide, I'm showing you the results from MADB that, again, scored quite high, over 50%. And in this case, the mutation that we made didn't do anything. And interestingly, this was the one that created this very, very strong hotspot here. So again, this might be a case of uh, a false positive in in silico analysis. So it's very important to combine these tools to try to get at what is important and what's not important, at least in, in the in vitro assays that you use. Um, so in the case of this protein, Clearly, this, uh, this area seemed to be the one that was responsible for driving positive responses in our in vitro assay. And then that one was the one that we chose to move forward um, as the lead molecule. So to, to summarize, um, in silico and in vitro immunogenicity tools can be used to help de-risk biologics. Um, we use this to help select lead biologics. And as I just showed you also, it can be used to help de-immunize um, lead, lead molecules. Um, and then combining in silico and in vitro tools can be used to increase confidence in making immunogenicity risk assessments, but we can never predict all the factors involved in clinical immunogenicity, which is why the field is tending to change the terminology from, you know, prediction to risk assessment. Finally, I just wanted to thank uh, the people involved. Um, mainly the, the immunogenicity risk assessment group, which I'm a part of. It's led by Joachim Hochemeyer. Um, Kate and Janaki listed here are the two that did um, the, the bulk of the PVMC and DC assay work. We also have Karen and Mike that are working on um, some of the other assays I described. We also have a group we work very closely with with in silico analysis that, that helped create that IDAB tool that I described. Um, this was led by Jonathan and Malcolm, but there's several others, Stephen, Stanley, and Akbar that were involved in this. And then obviously I can't do much unless there's protein science people that help make those proteins. And um, I had to block out the, uh, the case study uh, proteins, but I, I'd like to thank the leaders um, anonymously <laughs> for, for letting me share their data. Um, thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Govinda. I'm from the BC Cancer Agency. Uh, thanks, Darren, for the talk. That was really interesting stuff. Uh, I have two questions. Um, so one, uh, you show that um, by making those mutations uh, or those, those single amino acid changes in the, the two case studies there, you can reduce the immunogenicity down to the levels of the negative control, which is still 10% of your donors that have some response. So is, is that the acceptable threshold? How, how is 10% sort of set as what's an okay amount of immunogenicity? Uh, and then my second question is, is this uh, in vitro assay, uh, it, it's obviously capable of giving you a, an indication of the frequency of immunogenic uh, events that you would have in your, in your uh, patient pool, uh, but does it give you any indication of the severity of, of those uh, immunogenic responses? Okay. So um the first question first. So in, in our hands, we, we tend to see about 10% almost with every protein um, as a general background. We, we select 40 donors that are called healthy donors, but we never know full background of those donors. Um, and we tend to see one or two donors out of those 40 that kind of respond to everything. So there, there's definitely a background level that we consider. And so that's why we kind of put everything under 20% in this low risk category. Um, so that's how we, we do things. In general, when you look at clinical antibodies that are accepted and out there, they all run under 20. Um, it's only when it's above 40 where we get a little worried. Um, the second question, your strength question, um, we, we do readouts based on percent positive donors, and that was based on a lot of the work um, with the qualification study I showed you, where cohort to cohort 
it's very repeatable when you look at percent positive donors. If you did it by strength of noise, there's a little bit more of a, a interplay based on which donors you have, because you tend to have sometimes donors that make very strong responses. So um, what we do is we tend to use percent positive donors as a first pass. We also do a collective signal to noise for each donor and, and graph that. And that's our secondary thing. If two proteins are very close in the percent positive donors, we might pay attention to say, okay, does these five donors that make a response, is there a very big difference in the signal to noise in those five donors? Um, so that's what we do. There's no way to know, you know, strong or low response, how that's going to be affect, you know, what the effect of that is going to be in the clinic, unfortunately. Um, I'm Salim from Pfizer Immunogenicity Group, Andover. Among the 40 donors you selected, do you match the HLA typing or the other way I can say the high risk responses are from any specific HLA donors? So, so the, the 40 donors we use, we match to uh, the world population for DRB. Um, so, so we use a, a pretty broad range of donors. Um, so we, we do, um, the second question, we do look for correlations to see, um, so say a protein has 20% of positive responses, what I do is I scan the different HLAs and if it's not HLA associated, I would expect 20% across the board for each HLA. So we do compare that um, actual, actual score for all donors and then compare that to each of the HLAs in the assay and do look for a correlation. We've very rarely seen a correlation, and we have this argument all the time. Um, I, I think one of the main reasons is that we see positive responses in, say, six donors. <laughs> so you're never going to get a powerful enough number and, 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 and to, to really do statistics on that. Um, but in our hands, we've run probably 50-something cohorts, and it's very, very rare that I've seen an HLA correlation to a protein. Yeah, I had a question about the DC. Um, in vitro assays, so I know for the PBMCs you had 40 different donors. Is it the same for the DC? Yeah, it's the exact same setup. It's 40 donors. It's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> wow. Just one quick question. Did MAB1, MAB2, MAB A, MAB B, did they go into monkeys? And did you see the similar differences in monkeys? Um, trying to remember. Yes, they were both into monkeys. Um, I think in both hands they were pretty high. I don't think there was anything to distinguish them in, in monkeys okay. um, that I remember. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, Laurent Mallard, uh, I work with Lily. Thank you, a great talk. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. I, I will I focus on the one I really wonder about. Um, you mentioned the, the thought that some antibodies could interfere with the SA one way by suppressing an immune response, and you showed the carriage study, beautiful. Have you ever met the other side of it, where we try to immunostimulate the immune system, and again, the PBMC assay might not be very useful? And have you got example of that? Yeah, we have, um, we have done, so, you know, depending on whether a drug is for oncology or autoimmunity, we have run sometimes, and we've seen doubling, tripling of KLH responses and to drugs that do that. So we haven't quite narrowed down statistics for it, but we kind of, as an offhand, cut off about 50, 60 percent lower or higher than the KLH responses where we start thinking maybe there's a, an issue going on, and we might do some additional work to try to figure out what that is. Um, but definitely we see um, enhancement of KLH responses as well with certain proteins. Hi, I'm Ben Harley from New Immunitech. Uh, for the mitigation strategy, you consider the epitope for the T cell. So do you still consider the epitope for the B cell as well? Um, it's definitely something we've talked about, but we haven't um, done too much work on the B cell epitope side. From, from what I've seen, a lot of uh, the demonization of B cell epitopes, it seems like it's, it's, if you get rid of the main B cell epitope, it just moves to a different spot, whereas um, at least in the demonization papers I've seen, if you get rid of the major T cell epitopes, you can make something non-immunogenic. So our, our work has been focusing on the T cell uh, side of things. 
Yeah, just a quick question on the pro, you know the proposition of re-engineering. I guess we don't see so many people uh, re-engineer antibodies um, and really use the assays mainly as a sort of selector tool to choose. You know, like in the first study that you showed uh, to choose between bleeds. I mean, w from the point of view of your workflow, how can, can you talk how feasible it was to actually do the re-engineering and also, I guess, to do the revalidation that it still works. You know, at the end that you don't get any impairment in stability, binding, and, and so on? Yeah, for, for this particular um, case study that I presented, it was, it was actually part of, we, we worked with them very early. Um, so we were, you know, we, we, we work with anyone from, hey, this is our lead molecule, rubber stamp it and make it, <laughs> you know, see what the results are to, wow, we might have a problem with this program, we want to work with you early, we have 30 proteins. Um, and, and for that program, it was much more early. Um, so we were able to work with them very early and scan, I think we probably scanned 40 different proteins of theirs. Um, so it was immediately apparent that their, all their lead molecules had some issues in our, in our assays. So we were able to incorporate that into um, development for that program. Um, it, it's definitely would be an issue if it comes on later on. We haven't had that problem. We've normally done demonization either from programs very early or as a backup program for something that's moving on. Thank you very much, Darren. Thank you.